So today we're going to be talking about evidence-based literacy interventions to support young learners during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a webinar produced by the Regional Educational Laboratory or RHEL Midwest. Next slide. So first off, I'm going to read our virtual meeting conference recording notice. The American Institutes for Research allows for the recording of audio, visuals, participants, and other information sent, verbalized, or utilized during business-related meetings. By joining a meeting, you automatically consent to such recordings. Any participant who prefers to participate via audio only should disable their video camera so only their audio will be captured. Video and or audio recordings of any AIR session shall not be transmitted to an external third party without the permission of AIR. Next slide. Just a few housekeeping things up front. We are obviously using the Zoom platform and I'm sure that many of you are very comfortable with Zoom by now. Um, but just to point out a few features, if you aren't connected to the audio, you can click join audio in the Zoom toolbar. You also have the option to dial in via phone or to listen through the computer audio. If you have comments or questions for our presenters, please feel free to drop those into the chat box. We are also have closed captioning available and you can click on the CC button on the toolbar to access that. Next slide. So today we are going to be talking about evidence-based instruction, instructional practices and interventions to serve students in tier one, two, and three environments. We are joined here today by two literacy experts, Dr. Nell Duke and Dr. Laura Justice, who are going to be describing how to implement literacy instruction and interventions. Dr. Duke will describe effective practices for tier one instruction. Tier one, of course, is core reading instruction that occurs in general education settings. And then Dr. Laura Justice will discuss effective interventions in tier two and tier three settings. Students in tier two still receive tier one instruction, but need additional support to make progress. So they receive interventions in small group settings, often delivered by a teacher or an interventionist. And then students who have not responded adequately to interventions in tier one and two, and who are performing significantly below grade level, will move to tier three and receive an intensified comprehensive intervention in addition to their grade level instruction. In addition to presentations by these two academics, we also are pleased to have Dr. Lori Lee here from RHEL Southeast to talk about teacher and parent resources for supporting children's reading at home. We will then have Sheila Boozer and Debbie Thomas from one of our partner districts in Springfield, Illinois, describe their district strategies for meeting literacy needs of students in their district. Finally, we will conclude with a panel discussion and some concluding remarks. Next slide. So we'll start off just by introducing our speakers. My name is Jill Bowden and I am a research liaison here for RHEL Midwest. And I'm also part of the Midwest Early Childhood Education Research Alliance. I'm joined here today by Dr. Nell Duke, who is Professor of Literacy, Language, and Culture, the Combined Program in Education and Psychology at University of Michigan. We're also joined here today by Dr. Laura Justice, who's the Distinguished Professor of Educational Psychology at The Ohio State University, and Dr. Laura Lori Lee, who is at RHEL Southeast. She is the Improving Literacy Research Alliance Manager. In addition, we are joined by two of our district partners from Springfield Public Schools, Sheila Boozer, who's the Director of Teaching and Learning, and Debbie Thomas, who is the Literacy, Social Studies, and Library Coordinator from Springfield Public Schools. Before we launch into the presentations, I wanted to give an introduction to RHEL Midwest. RHEL Midwest stands for Regional Educational Laboratory, and RHEL Midwest is one of 10 regional 
educational laboratories that are funded through the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. Rail Midwest serves seven Midwest states, including Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. To address the priorities and interests of these states, Rail Midwest operates five research alliances and a networked improvement community, as well as other collaborations. The work of these partnerships is developed in consultation with the state education agencies and with local districts in the region. We encourage our attendees to sign up for the Rel Midwest newsletter, and we'll be dropping that link in the chat in case you're interested in getting information about the good work that we're doing throughout the region. Next slide. So as I mentioned, I am specifically working with the Midwest Early Childhood Education Re Research Alliance. This is one of our five alliances, and we are primarily based in the state of Illinois. And so we work really closely with five partner districts in Illinois around improving early literacy using research and data. Our projects include both applied research and technical assistance. We also produce many videos, infographics, and other types of innovative materials to engage with practitioners in our region. We wanted to highlight one recently published report, and we will be dropping a link to this report into the chat box in case you're interested in accessing it. Next slide. So without further ado, I want to hand it over to Dr. Nell Duke to discuss Tier 1 Classroom Literacy Instruction. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. I have 10 minutes to talk about Tier 1 Classroom Literacy Instruction, which is um, fine if I had another 200 hours after that, um, but I will uh, do my best. Um, could you turn over control, please? Now you have control. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll be talking today about three um, major suggestions. The first is um, to adopt an asset orientation. The second is to seek efficiencies in our work. And the third is to observe. And I'll argue that each of these are particularly important right now um, as we recover from the pandemic. So first I'll talk about adopting an asset orientation. Um, so the language that a lot of us are hearing around um, the COVID um, recovery, uh, terms like slide and lost and kids are behind and the cliff and the chasm um, have a sort of a negative tone to them and probably aren't going to result in the best kinds of attitudes we want to have toward children in our teaching. So I suggest avoiding that language if possible. Um, what we want to do is accelerate and intensify our uh, children's learning. Uh, Dr. Ernest Morrell at the University of Notre Dame Set, reminds us that the children have done nothing wrong. So wanting to keep a positive um, attitude and stance toward the kids as much as we can. Um, I have been hearing a lot of statements of, you know, kids have learned nothing the last nine months or kids have learned nothing the last year. And, you know, I think it's time, it, it's worth taking a little time to reflect on the fact that that's not the case, right? Humans learn, they learn all the time. Uh, they learn in lots of different settings and maybe they haven't learned what they would have learned if they were in school, but they have learned many things, including the ability to live through a once in a hundred year um, pandemic. So um, just kind of trying to remember to keep that asset orientation in this time. Collaborators and I um, carried out a, a project a few years ago in which we took a lot of different studies that had compared exemplary or highly effective teachers of literacy to teachers of literacy who are more average or, or mediocre or atypical or typical. Um, and what we looked for is what are some of the common themes that we see across these studies in terms of things that particularly good teachers of literacy do or exemplary or uh, highly effective teachers do. And one of the things that we found is that exemplary teachers tend to be more positive. They tend to be enthusiastic, curious, um, to have lots of praise and encouragement for, for children. And so that's a, a good piece, I think, to keep in mind uh, relative to this asset orientation idea. 
Um, exemplary teachers also foster success. Um, they tend to have very clear expectations for children and high expectations for children. And then they provide the scaffolding and the modeling and the instruction necessary for children to meet those high expectations. Exemplary teachers also teach for equity, which means they don't give every single student the exact same instruction. Rather, they adjust the instruction based on children's needs and strengths with the goal and the expectation that they will get every child to whatever benchmark or goal they've set. The second major um, point I'll make are, is around seeking efficiencies. So again, returning to our synthesis of research on highly effective teachers of literacy, one of the things you see with those teachers is that their teaching tends to be characterized by a very brisk pace of instruction. They have very clear routines, they just don't waste time, um, and their kids don't waste time, and so they pack more into a day, and that's probably part of why we see higher growth and higher achievement in their classrooms. So using time well has always been, of course, important, but I think we can all agree that using time well might be more important now than it ever uh, has been for us in our education system. So you really wanna be on the lookout for time wasters that are occurring in your classroom or in the classrooms you're coaching um, or in the schools or districts that you um, consult with or administrate. Um, so for example, um, morning work, uh, is often, uh, if you look at it and scrutinize it from a research perspective, not very um, productive for children's learning. Um, worksheets, there's just no evidence that worksheets um, foster growth or uh, student achievement, so they're not a very good use of time. Um, word searches um, are something I see far too often in classrooms. Again, no evidence that uh, word searches improve um, reading or writing achievement. Um, you know, a lot of these managerial issues, taking attendance, um, parts of calendar time that are really repetitive and, and no longer uh, needed for kids. Um, you know, these detailed picture walks where kids spend more time looking at every picture in the book than they do actually reading print. Also not good for um, kids' uh, literacy development. Giving kids time to read independently when they are not yet at a point where they can read independently um, is probably also not the best use of their time and so on. So looking for those, um, those time wasters is a really important um, idea. Another point around efficiency is that we want to look for those opportunities where we can get more bang for our buck or uh, feed two or more birds with one hand. Um, so, for example, um, lately in particular, it seems as though um, there's a tendency to break foundational skills up into more and more separate and discrete parts. But actually what research points us to is the reciprocity and interrelationship among foundational skills. So we want to look for opportunities where we're, for example, at the same time, both developing phonemic awareness and fostering knowledge of letter sound relationships or more technically and correctly graphing phoneme relationships. Um, and you can see the practice guide um, that you'll hear more about later uh, for more guidance on that point. Another idea is around um, trying to both build knowledge, for example, in science and social studies and develop literacy, for example, through developing knowledge of text structure, text features, application of con uh, comprehension strategies and so on. There's been some messaging um, out there to suggest that you sort of choose between knowledge and uh, strategy instruction, instruction about text, but that's not of what the research finds at all. Rather, um, much of the productive instruction simultaneously develops knowledge and um, teaches about texts and about strategies. So, um, and more information uh, on your slide about a very important um, example of feeding two or more birds with one hand uh, around integrating reading and writing. Again, many schools will have a separate time of the day for reading as for writing, but um, there is growing evidence that when we take a, an approach where we're doing reading and writing in a more integrated fashion and not letting one or the other absolutely dominate, we do see higher growth um, for students. Another point I wanna make about seeking efficiencies is that we really wanna orient ourselves to spending the least amount of time that's needed to develop any particular knowledge strategy or skill. 
Um, so I'm a bit concerned um, that I'm seeing in, in some places what seems like a race to spend more and more time on foundational skills. Like we're spending 60 minutes a day. Well, we're 75 minutes a day. Well, we're 90 minutes a day. The thing to understand here, and here I'm, I'm defining foundational skills um, as in the Common Core State Standards as being a phonological awareness, uh, letter sound relationships or phonics more broadly and word recognition, print concepts and fluency, um, that really the orientation I uh, suggest we take is, is sort of the opposite. It's a name that tune approach. Um, so for those of you familiar with name that tune, you know that somebody might say, I can name that tune in nine notes. And the other person says, I can name that tune in seven notes. And that's really the orientation I suggest we take around instruction. What's the least amount of time you can spend and get every student to where you need them to be? So what you're looking for there is efficiency and intensity in a brisk pace of instruction, as opposed to how can I spend more and more and more and more minutes on, on the same um, topic. Uh, it's really quality over quantity um, and keeping that mindset, I think will be important now more than ever. As you're seeking efficiencies, um, it won't surprise you to hear that I think you should try to um, really privilege practices with a strong research base. And so on your screen, you'll see a number of examples of resources with that um, strong research base. And my final point is that we really want to be observing uh, right now. Um, always that's been important, but more important now because kids will be coming to us and are coming to us with, in such different places with respect to their strengths and their needs in literacy and where they are uh, in their development of each area of literacy. So um, again, I want to point us to those exemplary teachers. Um, exemplary teachers use observation and assessment to inform their instruction, um, and they do so more than more typical teachers. They don't group kids the same way for the whole year. They form and reform groups throughout the year and design lessons to meet students' particular needs. And they're responsive to students. So they learn about students' cultural and linguistic backgrounds. They learn about their interests, strengths, and needs, and they design instruction accordingly. Finally, it won't surprise you, therefore, to know that exemplary teachers spend more time on small groups and in individual instruction than they do in whole group instruction, um, and then they do compared to other teachers uh, around literacy so that they can really take advantage of what they're learning from observing and assessing and tailoring instruction. So to sum up, I've offered three um, suggestions or recommendations for teaching in Tier 1 in this uh, pandemic, uh, one is to adopt an asset orientation, a second is to look for efficiencies in any way that we can, and the third is to make sure that we are observing and responding to individual students' needs. Thank you, Nell. And so next we're gonna hear from Dr. Laura Justice about interventions for tier two and tier three. Hi, good afternoon. I think you can see me. I hope you can see me. Okay, Nell is nodding at me. So, hi, I'm Laura Justice, and thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, I have 10 minutes to talk about um, the idea of tier two and tier three interventions. So I'll have to um, take Nell's advice and introduce some efficiencies uh, in my discussion as she represented um, exemplary teachers as doing. It's, a little bit of problem controlling the screen here. Um, Sarah, if you want to take control, maybe I can. You should. You should have it. Go ahead and click. Yeah, it seems to be a little bit more than a delay here. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and. Okay. Thanks. We actually did practice this. So, okay. Well, slide two. Um, we're going to talk about tier two and three uh, consider, inter, inter, considerations for designing tier two and tier three interventions. And 
Um, much of what I'm referencing in terms of um, the types of skills that we're going to target in these tier two and tier three interventions are highlighted in the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Next slide. Um, I really want to be clear that tier two and tier three are supplemental supports. And so the content that Professor Duke shared is actually more important than what I'm sharing, because if we get tier, two, tier one right, very few students are going to need tier two and tier three. And, you know, as a general rule of thumb, if your tier one reading curriculum is not supporting the reading development of the vast majority of kids in your classroom, at least 80%, um, your curriculum needs to be switched out or you need to figure out how to amplify your use of that curriculum. So tier, and two, tier two and tier three are supplemental supports provided to students who are not responding to the tier one environment. Um, so tier two is usually that first added tier um, kids might get this extra supplemental um, support system for a year. In some models, it's two years. And then the idea is that we add on tier three when children are not sufficiently responding to tier two. Um, and in actually the classic models of response to intervention approaches, you have tier one, you have tier two, you have tier three, and it's that tier three that's synonymous with identification of a reading disability. And so conceptually, you have a child who's had this phenomenal tier one instruction like Nell described, this add-on support via tier two for several years, and at tier three, you have reasonable evidence that even in the context of good instruction, this child uh, may in fact have a, um, a reading disability. Next slide. So again, just to reiterate, the idea of tier two, let's just focus on tier two, it's more intensive and specialized interventions. Um, and so what we're gonna do is layer on this, the type of things that um, Nell was talking about, highly efficient instruction that tackles foundational skills as well as um, more advanced skills. And we're identifying children on the base of, of their responsiveness to the tier one um, curriculum using robust tools designed to identify children's responsiveness or lack thereof. It is absolutely unequivocal that tier two and tier three are not a substitute for tier one. And in fact, the worst thing we wanna do is pull kids out of tier one and give them only the supplement. And that can be um, harmful to children and have an unintended consequences. Next slide. Okay. Um, so this, the purpose is to offer this more intensive specialized intervention as an augment to tier two, to tier one. And these should be designed to accelerate skill development through the provision of specialized, more intensive supports. The goal of these is actually preventive in nature. So we're gonna augment the tier one um, curriculum with these tier two system of support, and we're trying to reduce children's risk for um, having a reading disability. Okay, next slide. So when you're designing, um, I'm gonna again focus in on tier two because it's the most common types of supplement that we're gonna provide. The decisions that need to be made um, do have to focus on group size in the um, sort of classic articles on response to intervention. Um, you see in kindergarten, first grade, and perhaps second grade um, researchers in these large scale early tests would group children um, typically in smaller groups of about three to five kids. Um, obviously, there's decisions that have to go into um, group formation. Um, as, as Nell said, really great teachers use flexible grouping approaches. So if you're using data, you're observing, you're going to use the data to um, create flexible groupings. These are not just static groups you put kids in over, say, a year. And these are typically extra 20 to 30 minute sessions per week that are an add on to the supplemental curriculum. Um, and in my opinion, the best tier two that I've seen are highly structured, um, a fairly structured framework that follows a sequence um, that attends to um, 
students' motivation, which I highlighted first, and I'll mention why in a second, then those foundational skills, and then we cannot forget that we have to work on reading for understanding or comprehension. Next slide. Okay, and I did want to just comment briefly that there are lots and lots and lots of models out there. And so I just pulled up Michigan's MTSS Technical Assistance Center um, and looked at what some of their um, guidelines that they were presenting. And so I wanted to put this up here as an example of how what I'm talking about is actualized in everyday practice. Okay, next. Okay, I, when we are identifying kids for additional supports, um, kids are not unaware that this is happening. Um, and we want to proceed very, very cautiously when we start to give kids additional tiers of support. Um, and going back to use um, Nell's uh, language, let's take a, an asset orientation. And the reason I bring this up is because motivation and reading are very intimately intertwined. If you have kids who are not motivated towards reading or have a poor self-concept con about reading, they're going to read less and, and therefore get less practice in this really important skill. So um, I, gave, I put a link here to a recent article about some, some, te some excellent teachers gave advice about how they've addressed motivation towards reading, but we want to attend to both the child's self-confidence or self-concept as a reader, um, you know, am I a good reader? Am I a struggling reader? And then also their beliefs about reading and ideally have a motivation towards believing that reading is important and something they want to do. So always keep this asset orientation at the top of the list of structuring these um, additional tiers of support. Um, and then jumping to the next slide, um, the typical tier two intervention as described in countless research articles is going to give pretty significant attention to these foundational reading skills like phonemic awareness, graphing phoneme correspondence, decoding, um, uh, reading some connected text for fluency. Um, but it also, if you want to jump to the next slide, we have to be really cautious about the temptation to ignore reading comprehension that we often see in tier two um, sessions. And so a lot of the early models of tier two is this really relentless focus on foundational skills. But when we do that, we're crowding out um, attention to really important comprehension skills, such as inferencing or teaching um, more abstract vocabulary words, engaging in text structure analysis. So we have to, as, as Nell mentioned, we have to make sure that that integrates um, into our tier two and in fact has a complementary um, feel to the more foundational work we're doing. Next. Um, I'm simply at this point reiterating um, what Professor Duke shared. The only way for tier two to work is if it's data driven. We have got to be very thoughtful about the kids that we're going to provide tier two for, who we're going to provide tier two for. And then we have to provide ongoing monitoring of data because kids should come in and come out of tier two interventions. Um, and a lot of the early, really exciting studies about um, provision of tier two supports and early reading instruction is kids graduate out of tier two. So you have a group of kids, we might call them early responders, where they get tier two maybe for 10 weeks of an add-on and um, teachers look at the data and say, okay, uh, tier two is no longer needed. And then you have another group of kids who might respond and then graduate over the next 10 weeks and, and so on and so forth. And so this is not a static disposition towards kids. Oh, you're struggling, here's your tier two and you're gonna sit here like this for the next two years. That is not at all what um, response to intervention models are about. And it's about careful, thoughtful, close monitoring of kids and then adding and removing tiers on the basis of what the data is telling you. Next slide. Okay, I got to my last slide, I think, without a moment to uh, spare. So I will uh, turn it back over to Jill. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. So our next presenter is Dr. Lori Lee, and Lori is going to be telling us about teacher and parent resources for supporting children's reading at home. Lori? Yeah, 
You'd think I'd know Zoom by now, right? So good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you. I come to you from Morel Southeast. So I'm housed in Tallahassee, Florida, but I have um, a deep love for the Midwest. I am a native Illinoisan, and so um, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I appreciate the invitation. And, and I appreciate what Dr. Duke and Dr. Justice shared with us, those, um, the importance and they provided such comprehensive and concise presentations regarding those various tiers of literacy instruction and how important they are uh, that our students uh, receive a solid tier one uh, experience and then those students that need additional assistance receive that. And so I'd like to share with you a couple of resources that our regional educational lab, and we serve North and South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida, uh, that we've developed to support our teachers in engaging with their families and helping to support uh, literacy and engagement in literacy with students at home. Uh, the request for the resource, this teacher resource I'm gonna share with you, uh, came from one of our governing board members and our governing board um, serves to guide some of our work and uh, one of our members from Georgia requested this resource for their teachers and they said uh, the governing board member said that uh, this is something our teachers need in order to help them to facilitate uh, the support of literacy in the home. And so um, we were very familiar with the Foundational Reading Skills Practice Guide uh, that has been mentioned a couple of times, both by Dr. Duke and by Dr. Justice. Uh, it so happens that the panel chair of that practice guide is our former director, Dr. Barbara Foreman, uh, and also Dr. Justice served on that panel as well. Uh, so RRL had already developed a professional learning community that was centered on that practice guide. And so we use that practice guide and the recommendations and how-to steps as a basis for teacher guides to engage their families. And so we're in the midst of third grade. What we've done is created uh, a, a teacher guide for each grade level, kindergarten through third grade. Uh, specific to that grade level and addressing all of the recommendations and how-to steps in the practice guide. And the practice guide does have recommendations that span the grade levels and also recommendations that are only pertinent at certain grade levels. And so each one of those guides contains the recommendations and the how-to steps uh, for our teachers then to um, engage with parents in regard to um, their, um, their literacy uh, support at home, okay? All right, so uh, let me just share a little bit about this teacher resource. And the teacher resource, again, was based on the practice guide um, that um, is uh, related to foundational reading skills. And you see on your screen uh, some of the components of the um, teacher guides and also uh, just a representative um, page out of one of them. So you see that they, uh, there's an overview of the practice guide recommendations, there's a glossary and a number of other resources for our teachers. So for instance, in the kindergarten um, teacher's guide, there would first of all be a, a recommendation reminder. And that's after some introductory information regarding how to use the guide and how it was developed and a little bit about the practice guide. And, and so then each recommendation and how to step is actually represented um, in three sections. So there's a recommendation um, reminder and that is, um, that is um, uh, it basically states the recommendation and the how to steps. And then uh, there's an overview provided for the teacher, which is, uh, which is written in very professional language. It talks about things like dialogic reading. Uh, there's also a glossary with that recommendation reminder that reminds teachers of some of those terms that they uh, may or may not be familiar with. So all of that is available for the teacher as a resource. And then following that, there's a teacher's scaffold. And a page of the teacher scaffold is what you see on your screen. And so the teacher scaffold actually has language that the teacher can draw from to have a conversation with the families of their students. 
And so uh, you see that um, the language is family friendly and it's certainly not meant to be read verbatim, although that could be done, uh, but it's there as a resource for the teacher to engage with their families. And this could be done um, at, at a literacy night, at an open house, during a parent-teacher conference, a variety of ways that teachers could engage with families. You see the preparation box that's there. And the preparation box just shares with the teacher what kinds of resources from the teacher guide that they need to have available to them as they uh, work with their families. And so there are references to videos and we have a wide variety of videos that have been filmed. And I was just so pleased with, uh, with our videos because they're very authentic. They were filmed in homes. Uh, occasionally you might see a cat that wanders through a living room. You might hear background noise of brothers and sisters that are engaged in another room. All of it is just very authentic. And, and uh, that's what we wanted families to see, that the activities that they could engage in uh, with their children at their home, that's doable. And, and it doesn't have to be a perfect environment. It's just uh, their home. And so the videos are there to support um, the activities that would be presented to families, and then anything that would need to be printed. So the, the family activities, which are contained in the next section, are activities that are pretty much self-contained. And, and so uh, those activities can be, um, can be used by families without any cost to them at all. Uh, and teachers would just print those activities out and share them with families, explain to them. There are instructions in the teacher's guide that explain exactly uh, how to share with those with families and what families would need to do. And, and so those family activities are there. And, and like I said, they're pretty much self-contained. And so uh, there might be things to print, but other than that, they really don't need anything to conduct those activities. So again, we have those teacher guides available for grades kindergarten through third grade teachers. Uh, the grades K-2 have been released and hopefully you'll have um, in the chat they'll place those links. Everything is free of charge so our teacher guides are absolutely free. Um, you can go to the links where they're located and just download them. Uh, the third grade guide is coming and so that should be available very soon. So that's the resource for our teachers. And then in the advent of um, our pandemic, uh, this resource came to be. And this is a resource that is targeted directly to our families. Uh, and, and what we have done, and actually this seed was planted even before March 2020, and that was, and it was actually done by um, our colleagues here at Rail Midwest who said, why don't you guys just pull out the activities for families and somehow market them directly um, to those families? And so as March 2020 came upon us and it became very clear that um, parents were going to spend a lot of time in their homes with their children and have less time um, at their local school or engaging with the, the teachers of their children, uh, we decided that um, perhaps we could create a website. And what we would do would be basically pull out all of those wonderful activities that were included in the teacher guides. And here you see it, uh, basically what that website looks like. Uh, this is still, again, based on that practice guide we talked about, but you'll see the recommendation is written in much more family-friendly kinds of terms, so in lay language. The website is free, again, to everyone. Any videos that were pertinent to the recommendations um, that were highlighted in the teacher's guide along with those how-to steps, those video videos are included there along with those key points. And uh, we had that in the teacher's guide as well, uh, just a little box that said, here's the key points from this particular video. So teachers didn't have to wonder what they were looking for. And in the same way, families don't have to wonder what they're looking for. And then the activities also are there for families to access. The instructions are written in a very family-friendly kind of way. 
And so um, great care was taken to make this a very positive kind of website. Included uh, throughout is language indicating to our parents that this needs to be a positive experience between them and their children, that if their children are becoming frustrated that um, they should feel free to stop that particular activity. And even if it's a first grade activity and the child's in first grade and it just doesn't seem to be going well, that's okay. And so uh, we encourage them to back up where they need to and to move forward where they need to as well. Uh, but in these particular times uh, where we know that there's just so much stress and there's been so much adjustment that has need been needed to be made, uh, we wanted to make sure that this resource was something that was very family friendly um, to um, our parents and our caregivers out there. Um, I just looked up the numbers to see uh, the success kind of of our website. And I can tell you that over 7,100 people, we've had over 7,100 unique views of the website. And we've had over 71,000 downloads from this website. And so we're really excited about it. We're grateful that we could create this website and these resources in such a short amount of time. Again, we started at when spring was coming to be last week, last um, year, it was complete and up by June. And so we are grateful that um, we could not only provide some resources for our teachers to engage with our, their families, but also resources that parents could directly use with their children. And so um, if you have questions or um, need more in information, my contact information is there and um, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Lori. You're getting lots of love in the chat. I think teachers and families have found those resources to be exceptionally helpful. I'm pleased now to turn it over to our partners from Springfield Public Schools, Sheila Boozer and Debbie Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. This is so exciting. Um, I just have to say that it is a breath of fresh air working with REL Midwest um, over the past few years, having this information at our fingertips available to us from um, researchers that we can apply because being a practitioner in a school district that serves students from all walks um, and that deserve the best and the most quality education, it is a powerful tool and resource to have REL Midwest and the resources available to us. Um, I've, I'm really excited to know that every single component that has been presented really solidifies what we do in our district in Springfield 186, um, starting with that whole having um, that seeking to adopt and, and well, to adopt and, and seek and, and observe and making sure we have those strong family partnerships um, and, and focusing on a strong tier one instruction um, and then thinking about how tier two and tier three comes into play when needed. But we have to make sure that tier one is accelerated um, and it's, it's, it's an inviting, it's a joyful experience and we're motivating our students to wanna learn. So with that being said, I'm going to just talk a little bit about how we're gonna to move into what we call um, our summer learning fifth quarter um, for Springfield Public Schools. And it's exciting because our goal is to really continue the learning um, as, seamlessly as, as seamlessly as possible from our fourth quarter into the summer without making it feel like school is long and drawn out. So we really want to make this fun and, and engaging. So we're going to call it our fifth quarter, so to speak. Um, and we, we've, we've seen some growth. And we, we, we want to continue to see that growth. And I loved it when I heard that this is not a race, um, but it's about quality. And it's not looking at students didn't learn because our students have been learning. Um, and, and, and we hear that teaching hasn't been happening, but our teachers across the country and in 186, Springfield 186 have been teaching. And we want to make sure we can continue to extend that. So we have a lot of academic and social and emotional needs that we just want to make sure that we are addressing. So our plan over the summer includes extending summer learning, um, or extending our summer learning time frame. In the past, it was only been it's only been three weeks, but this year, this summer, we want to extend it to six weeks with some flexible schedule for our, for our teachers, because realistically, we know some of our teachers are exhausted. 
just as our families and our kids are exhausted. So we don't want to burn, burn everyone out. So we are having a flexible schedule. So for example, one group of teachers can teach for the first three, three weeks of, of the summer program. And then another group can teach the, um, next three weeks and then we built in a plan or we're building in a plan for to, to share the data um, between those teachers around the students so that there's a, a seamless handoff so to speak. Um, we've also removed barriers for this process and this program over the summer. Um, in the past we've had criteria where we could only have a certain amount of students participate so we're opening it up for all of our students to be eligible um, and by doing that that means we have to open up multiple sites. So we have some school flexibility um, for, those, for those schools, but we also have set some district parameters to make sure that um, all of our students are getting it with what they need. We're meeting our students where they are. Um, we are planning to do some additional learning opportunities after the summer program. So right before school starts, if a school decides they wanna do something and bring in a group of students and, and work with them right before the beginning of the school year, um, they can do such things, um, do, that, do, that, do that kind of work as well. Um, and we can't do this without our community partners. Community partners are crucial to this work. Um, and with that, we, some of our community partners, we look at our, um, we have a Camp Compass, we have Boys and Girls Club, we have the Urban League, we have 21st Century, and I'm sure there are other community organizations out there um, that are partnering with us. Um, and what we're doing is working together to make sure we're providing our students exactly what they need, not what we think they need, but what they need. Um, based upon the data, which drives, takes me to the next piece. And I'm speaking fast because I got to share this time with my, my colleague, Debbie Thomas. But we also want to make sure we have data-driven offerings to meet the varying needs of our students. Um, and so we, we're going to have a small set of prioritized um, standards and skills that we want to make sure our students um, are exposed to in order to be ready to learn for the next grade level once the next school year begins. But we don't want to just stay there and be skill driven because it's more than that. We wanna make sure this is a joyful experience. So with that being said, we're incorporating some social and emotional learning because our students have gone through quite a bit over this, these past, um, this past year with so much they've seen and experienced in, in the news, in their own homes. Um, and, and, and you've heard it several times before from others, um, um, great speakers and researchers who've talked about the different pandemics that our students and families are experiencing, you know, the academic, the, the COVID, we're talking about social emotional issues that they're experiencing. We're talking about them having economic issues that they're um, going through, um, the racial pieces. So we have to make sure that we're like making sure our students and our families are okay and are ready to learn um, in, 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 in multiple ways because they've been learning all along. So with that being said, we're gonna make sure we infuse this, pro this, this, this program over the summer with technology. Um, we're gonna make sure it has some enrichment pieces in there so we can send home um, like, like care packages, so to speak, or fun packages for our students. Um, if they wanna cook something at home, so all the ingredients, we'll send those home and the kids can read and follow the directions. So that's gonna also incorporate some reading and some math. So those are some of the things we're talking about doing, and there, there are more to it, but this is, a, this is a brief overview. So we're really fully invested in advancing the learning opportunities for all of our students with the summer learning being the first step, but it's equally important to make sure we continue this work into the fall. Um, so we've adjusted our curriculum guides to meet the needs of our students. Um, one of our most important focuses is how to differentiate instruction through small group instruction and through interventions that we will also provide. Um, and so the first step we'll see is where our students are um, functioning and where they are ready to learn when they come when they return into our buildings. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Debbie Thomas, so she can really go more into the, the guide um, of differentiation and intervention for our school district. Debbie, you're on. Gonna, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna pick up right where she le left off and talking about how we're going to plan for gauging where our students are when, when they come back in the fall. Uh, we've had some real success with assessing students this year, even in the remote setting. We've also had some real challenges, as I'm sure many of you have had. And so we know it's gonna be really important during that, right at the start of the year, to um, have an accurate read on our students' strengths and their needs. 
And once we have that information, then our plan really begins. So we want to have a small set of skills identified by grade level. So we know that some of our students are going to come with some pretty big needs and that can be overwhelming. And so we want to make sure that we have narrowed it down to say, if first graders are coming in and they have these needs, where do we start? What are the very few skills that we absolutely need students to master right away? And so then um, once we have those skills identified, then we need to think about, okay, how will we know if they are mastering those skills? And so we are identifying a few assessments that teachers can have at their fingertips and um, as well as considering ways to assess through daily learning experiences. So for example, um, instead of you know, constantly stopping to assess, we want teachers to use their instruction as assessment. So if a, if a teacher is having students, for example, writing CVC words on individual whiteboards, the teacher can be observing and taking note of where the students are with their phonics acquisition. So um, then the assessment is, is actually part of the instruction. And then the, the, the third part that we really want to think about is um, how can we help teachers have a strong toolbox so that they have a few effective instructional tools for each of those skills that they are wanting kids to master. So on the next slide, you'll see just a visual of a little snippet of a document that we're working on for our district. And this is a first grade example. So you'll see in that first column, a few prioritized skills. And actually these are all kindergarten skills that based on, our, on this year's data, we know we will have a lot of students needing to work on those. So right at the beginning of the year, these are the skills that we really wanna work on in our small group differentiated instruction, as well as an intervention. And then the next column you see, what are a few assessments that we could use? And I will tell you, we're already gonna revise this document again because um, we realized we need to add in there some of those suggestions for the um, ways to gather that information through instruction. And then in the third column, you see those instructional tools that teachers can use. There are so many tools out there. So we're just trying to narrow it down so they have a starting place of some of the more effective um, ways to really address those skills. And then this is for the beginning of the year, but then the document goes on to say, okay, and then what's the next set of skills and the next set of skills? And the other thing that's on this document, um, there's a couple of things you can't see. One is comprehension is not on this little slice, but I want you to know that it absolutely is in the document because we believe that, that connecting meaning tightly to that word solving work is so important. And then the other thing that you can't see on here is the um, phonological awareness and phonics continuum. So teachers can say, okay, here's the first set of skills, but I have students maybe that are above that or below that. They'll have that progression then to be able to tell right where they need to start with their students so that they can differentiate effectively. So I can tell you that this is definitely a work in progress for us. And um, even today, I've been learning more and thinking about how you know, we can adjust our plans for the future. We've heard such great ideas, and I'm anxious to put what we've learned into practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila and Debbie. At this point, we're going to launch into our panel discussion, and I invite all of our presenters to join me on video. And I also invite all of our attendees to enter questions that they might have into our chat box. So we're gonna to start today's discussion off with the first question here, which is what should district administrators do to prepare for literacy instruction and assessment in the fall of 2021? And I'm going to pick on Sheila. She knew that was coming. She knew it was coming because I always pick on her. Yeah, I was hoping someone else would, would speak <laughs> up. But um, <laughs> basically, everything we've already discussed here um, from the very beginning um, with, um, I was it Dr. Duke, who explained the fact, you know, making sure your tier one instruction is, is um, on point, but not so much worried about 
some, uh, you know, loss from learning from the pandemic because learning has been, has continued. I think one of the things that district administrators need to do pre to prepare is to see where our students are ready to learn and meet them where they are and don't have a mindset of we're going to make all this up in um, a year because we're not. That doesn't even make sense to even try to do that. Meet each student where they are and create plans for them and, and bring the teachers to the table and, and help make sure your teachers are strong with data and you're creating a data literate system so that data can be your friend, but it shouldn't, it, you, we, you can't stop with just that. It's the whole child. So thinking about it from that perspective as well, is, is the literacy, literacy instruction equitable? Is it bringing in and meeting the kids where they really are? Are we taking into consideration their social and emotional needs while we're doing all these things? Are we making sure our teachers are okay? So, and, and are we partnering with our parents and families? So those are the things that I say as a district administrator. I could just add in, I agree with everything that was just said. Um, I would just wanted to put in a plug for um, districts considering putting into place tutoring programs or if they already have them expanding tutoring programs. I'm suggesting that because we know that a high dosage tutoring, meaning tutoring that has uh, frequent meetings during the week of a certain length of time um, is associated with student growth, even when the um, teachers are paraprofessionals or even volunteers with the right program and structure, they can still make a big difference for students. And although you could argue that any year it would be good to have, you know, tutoring available for students, I think we could all agree that it might be especially important to have um, tutoring available um, for the coming year. There's a, a nice um, piece I'll drop in the chat um, that researchers at Brown University put together that summarizes some of the research on effective tutoring models and points to a few specific models. Um, so that's something I, I might add in as a special consideration for district administrators right now. Totally agree, 100%, 100%. So our second question here for the panel is, children follow different developmental trajectories in developing reading and writing skills. And the question is, how can classroom educators understand and serve children given what we expect to be a wide variation in skill development in the fall of 2021? I'll just say my first thought on that is that it's going to be more important than ever that we provide some very concise and explicit whole group instruction that is brief so that we have time then to really provide the differentiated small group instruction that we need. It's just so easy to turn mini lessons into maxi lessons. And we're, we think we're doing great teaching and then we realize, oh, the, the students aren't actually listening anymore. So if we can keep that brief, so then we can really spend our time in that differentiated small group instruction. To see that I think teachers have always managed to have many different children with many different strengths and many different areas of need. Um, and certainly in pre-K to grade three, that's business as usual <laughs> to have a range mm -hmm. uh, in terms of where kids are. And so I would um, just encourage everybody to know, yeah, it'll probably be a little more extreme this year. Maybe there'll be a little bit more difference, but you know, we, we've got this, we know how to do this. We've done this before. It, it's following uh, Debbie's very wise advice. You know, when most of the class needs something, teach it whole class, be brisk. And then from there, we do our differentiation. And when the teacher is with a small group, we make sure that what the other children are doing is productive. Um, things like partner reading, for example, has very strong Certain models of partner reading have very strong research support. So those would be a really, that would be a really good thing for kids to be doing when, when they're not with the teacher. So I just, um, just want to give us a, we can do this. We've got it. And I love the fact that you brought out that we've already been doing this. Um, it's nothing new. It's just a thing, maybe a little bit more intense because it's everyone is, is seeing it everywhere. But I think the piece that makes it more doable, if we just remember 
that everyone, every school, every teacher is experiencing the exact same thing. So we're all in the pool together, so to speak. So um, it, it's not unique. We're not unique in that regard, but we can be, we can meet the needs of all of our students, but it's gonna take time, intensity, and it's also, we have to be uh, methodical and um, we also need to be intentional in how this, we make this happen. Great. So now I'm gonna deviate from the questions that we have um, prepared to start addressing some of the questions that are showing up in the chat box. Uh, here's a question for you, Dr. Justice. Do you have a favorite tier two system to use? Uh, I really hate to um, make any sort of recommendation about a specific approach. Um, the only thing I'm going to say, in, and I would actually look to some of my colleagues to jump in when I'm done, because they might be more on the ground um, with respect to looking at success, um, successful programs. But I am going to tell you that in general, I have a very, very strong bias towards the simpler, the better. Um, and so there's some, you know, old model, models that are out there. I think um, Nell mentioned um, tutoring program, um, the voluntary tutoring program. There's an old model that's been around quite a while called Book Buddies, it comes out of University of Virginia, very simplistic approach. Um, and the reason I really push for that is because um, the easier something is to implement, the more likely we can scale it effectively. And so I actually got a long, long email earlier today from an educator about all the screenings that they use in their school and just lists and lists of screenings. And I thought, well, that's just too much. You won't know what to do with that. So, you know, I would look for um, the, so the solutions that are out there for structuring your tier two that are simpler um, rather than more complicated. Um, and then just be really attentive to how that's going. And Maybe others can comment on specific um, programs they've used or approaches, I should say. Well, I support everything you just said. And I just add that when you're considering a program, what you want to do is, is look for the research on it. Um, don't get that research from the people who are selling the program because mm -hmm. guess what? They always always seem to have data to tell you that their approach works. Um, but rather um, going to Google Scholar, um, going to the What Works Clearinghouse, um, looking at research reviews, you know, that that's how, you know, you can get uh, really data that you can trust more um, to see whether, you know, that's been a program that has shown positive effects and very important to look at as compared to what. So if you have an intervention program that's been proven to be effective compared to no intervention, that's not saying much, right? Um, it's, you know, is that intervention program effective compared to some other credible intervention program? That's where you start to, you know, feel confident. So I definitely suggest to people, you know, looking, looking at that research and I love Dr. Justice's um, you know, recommendation to also, you know, kind of keep it simple, um, you know, look for, for those approaches that are tried and true, that have been effective in multiple studies, and, you know, that have a very clear focus and probably brisk pace of instruction as well. And I just want to add to that, I, I, being a practitioner, I love anecdotal data. <laughs> so I am not opposed to contacting other districts who have utilized the product or the program to see how it works to and, and to see get their perspective on how user-friendly it is. Do they have to spend a lot of time on the logistics of trying to make it work? Um, or is it simple and you get the results that you're needing? And then what is the demographic data? How are the, the different demographics um, and students responding to that intervention? So um, those, are, those are key questions that Debbie and I are not afraid to ask. We'll pick up a phone or email or what have you and, and call and ask because I totally agree. The practitioners utilizing the tool the, um, and the program makes a difference when you hear from them and they'll give you the truth, especially teachers. I think too that districts really do need to have the capacity to implement whatever that is effectively. 
Uh, and so, and not try to modify or morph something into what it isn't. And this comes back to Laura's comment about it being simple. If it's simple, it's more likely you can do that. But if, if you're looking at a particular uh, program or, or practice and it's complex and you're trying to fit it in with what you're doing, then that might not be the best approach. Um, just because it, this, the studies are done uh, as the, the program was intended to be um, delivered. And so if the district doesn't have that capacity to do it that way, then the likelihood that you'll receive the results that the study um, reflected is probably not as great. Great. So the next question that we have in the chat is, with regards to reading assessments, how often should students be assessed if they are reading at or beyond grade level? And also what reading assessments do you recommend? I think some of my colleagues know I love this question. <laughs> um, so um, for me, uh, we're, uh, observation is a form of assessment and we should be observing all the time. So we're always assessing. And that's one of the things you see in that exemplary teacher's literature. Um, I remember hearing uh, an, an anecdote of one of the, the researchers involved in that work, the late Michael Presley, um, sharing that in general, when you talk to exemplary teachers, they just know more about each student than more typical teachers do. They can just give you much more information. And part of that is they're making use of observation as an assessment tool in an ongoing way. Um, the uh, a, a somewhat more formal but still informal tool that I'll drop in the chat is um, something colleagues and I uh, have been working on for a while as an alternative to running records um, that we think is better aligned with research and our range of research. It's an informal tool. It's free on my website with lots of information about how to use it and examples. And basically, every time a child's reading or writing, you have this tool um, and it directs your attention to specific aspects of reading and writing that have been shown in research to matter and to be good targets for teaching. And that way, on an ongoing basis, every time you see a child read or write, you're actually getting assessment um, data that can inform your grouping and your next steps in instruction. So I think for your students where you're not as worried about them, maybe they feel just in general like they're above you know, grade level expectations, they're still reading and writing. So this is a tool I would apply with them. And I would also you know, think about applying this or another observation guidance tool with um, students you know, who, who are not not yet meeting grade level expectations as well to inform um, your targets of instruction on an ongoing basis. Three assessments a year is not enough. So if you just have, you know, your beginning, middle, and end of the year assessment results, uh, that's, that's not going to do it. And, and you really do need to use some of these more formative and informal uh, tools as well. I had written down a note, Nell, to respond to that question with exactly what you just said, that um, it's, it's not the three times a year, although we do that. It is about how you're doing this in an ongoing way, you know, as part of instruction so that it is more seamless and not that, that stop to assess, stop to assess, stop to assess. Great. I think we have time for one final question. And Lori, this might be right up your alley. Uh, so the question is, do you have a recommended resource for families to connect with throughout the summer to support their young learners at home? So thinking particularly about K through one families who will not be in a summer in-person program, but who want to work on maintaining what they've learned throughout the year. All right. I really think that the, the website I shared during the webinar is probably one of the best resources for families because everything is presented very simply and those skills are, are directly from that foundational reading skills practice guide. And so that, you know, that shameless plug almost, but I think that's a really uh, wonderful resource during the summer for families to access and engage in those activities, view those videos, et cetera. Um, and so I think that would be a valuable resource. Uh, that, that could be uh, of help to them. And then I just think that, you know, reading aloud to students, uh, for those students that can read themselves, listening to your children read, that's just so valuable. And that time is very well spent. And so 
uh, making sure those experiences are positive and that um, that you're reading with your children, reading to your children, and just engaging in some of those activities we provided, I think would be very helpful. Great. All right, well, that brings our panel discussion to a close. I would like to thank all of our panelists and presenters today. Everybody did such a fantastic job. We gave them such a challenge in presenting their material in 10 minutes a piece. And so I know that's always difficult, but I know that I got a lot from listening to this webinar and I hope you did as well. Um, we will be sending out resources, links to the resources um, that we link to here in the chat. And so don't worry about trying to bookmark all of those links as they're coming across live in the chat. We'll send out an email to everybody who registered to the registered for the webinar with links both to the practitioner facing resources, the family facing resources, and even some of the reports like the What Works Clearinghouse practice guides um, that were mentioned by our presenters. We also invite you to follow Realm Midwest for more information on Twitter at Realm Midwest or to sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on additional resources and events that are going on. If you would like to request a certificate of participation, um, you can air, email Sarah Metrano and her email address is here on the screen. Next slide. So please join me in thanking our presenters, Dr. Duke and Dr. Justice, Dr. Lee, Sheila Boozer and Debbie Thomas. In my final minute, I'm going to share with you some of our resources that we've created here at Realm Midwest that are related to literacy. We invite you to check out our infographic on best practices for teaching beginning readers. This was based off of recommendations from the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide. Uh, it's a nice cheat sheet for teachers or administrators who are working on increasing their um, use of best practices in the classroom with the hope of affecting student outcomes. We also have several short videos that are meant to support professional development. They're short in the sense of, you know, between three to five minutes, so they can easily plug into professional development that you might be planning or facilitating at your schools. So we will send those links out. We have one video that is about supporting struggling readers in primary grades with a multi-tier intervention framework. And we have another video that is hot off the presses that is all about systematic and explicit instruction in phonics and phonological awareness. So be on the lookout for that email with those resources. Next slide. Uh, finally, we will be sharing all of the research that the presentations were based on in case you want to check that out um, after the presentation. And so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today.